You know, from the earliest days of the church, a, a practice developed among Christians that became a tradition related to the reason that we're all here on this Easter Sunday morning. A Christian would greet another believer by saying, he is risen, and the other believer would respond by saying, he is risen indeed. So I want us to try that right now. I'm going to say the first line, and you say the second part, okay? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, throughout the rest of this message, you have an assignment, and your assignment will be to repeat that line with great gusto whenever it appears on the screen, all right? Can you handle that? All right. People have not gathered for the past 2,000 years to say the stock market has risen. It has risen indeed. They've not gathered to say the dollar has risen or the employment rate has risen or the equity in my house has risen or the value of my 401k has risen. There's only one hope that has held human beings across every continent and culture together for two millennia in the face of difficult times and poverty and disease and pain and persecution and unpredictable presidential campaigns and even in the face of death. And that hope is that Jesus Christ is risen. No one's exactly sure when this practice started, but we're pretty sure about the passage of scripture it's based on. It comes from the gospel writer Luke's biography of the life of Jesus from chapter 24 and verse 34. This is from the New King James translation. And it says, the Lord is risen indeed. I want to talk to you about that little word indeed. Why did the early Christians feel a need to add the word indeed? For that matter, why does anyone feel the need to say indeed? Well, the website, vocabulary.com, says it's grammatically correct to use the word indeed to add emphasis to a statement. Think of it as another way to say, that's right, or oh yeah. Like, are you seriously going to eat that entire one pound chocolate bunny in one city? Indeed I am. (laughs) It's another way of saying, you better believe it. You know it. As our friends from the northern states would say, you betcha. This little word is hugely significant when we consider that there are some people who think the resurrection of Jesus is not to be taken literally, that it's not to be believed that it actually happened. And they put forth the idea that resurrection is a metaphor. It's more symbolic than substantial. It's more hyperbole than historical. The idea being that after Jesus died, his disciples found themselves still thinking about him and his teachings, and they were still very moved by his remarkable life and his generous spirit. It was kind of like he was still alive in their memories and in their hearts, kind of like the spirit of John Lennon or Elvis is still alive today. You know, their lives represented an idea that many were attracted to and attached themselves to, and their untimely deaths, rather than extinguishing the light of their life, on the contrary, magnified it to an even brighter and fuller flame than when they were alive. And some people think the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is like that. And over time, The idea of resurrection kind of evolved as a symbol, meaning that goodness will ultimately triumph. Badness will not win in the end. This idea essentially says, look, we all know that when you die, you die. That's it. We get it. So the resurrection is just really a metaphor for the triumphant human spirit or for human optimism. But it didn't really happen. It's just a metaphor. Well, of course, the problem with that theory is something happened that transformed a little group of people 2,000 years ago, and I don't think they were changed by the idea that Jesus was risen metaphorically. They didn't form the world's first community to include Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, rich or poor, breaking down every ethnic and cultural barrier based on a metaphorical resurrection. They did not sacrifice their land and property and possessions and reputation and vocations and positions based on a symbol. They did not go to their deaths voluntarily by the thousands, believing they would be resurrected metaphorically. They did it because they believed Christ is risen historically. They understood all about death. They knew what death looked like, and they felt its sting even deeper than many of us have. Did you know average life expectancy in the first century? factoring in the enormously high infant mortality rate was between the ages of 30 and 35. This Jesus that they followed died right in the middle of that average lifespan, around the age of 33. But then three days later, his tomb was found to be empty. But the real news was not about where the dead body of Jesus wasn't. 
it became more about where the resurrected body of Jesus was as he started appearing to people in many different places. First to a woman named Mary Magdalene, then to some other women, and then to his remaining 11 disciples, one of whom had some serious doubts about his reported resurrection, a man named, by, a man named Thomas. And then he appeared to them by the Sea of Galilee and finally on the side of a mountain overlooking the city of Jerusalem. He starts popping up everywhere, so much so that Luke writes in his second book, the book of Acts, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a, 40, over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. One of those 40-day post-resurrection appearances is summarized by the Apostle Paul when he wrote to the church in the city of Corinth that after Jesus was raised from the dead, look at what he wrote, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, most of whom, he says, are still living. In other words, this is Paul's way of saying, this all really happened. You can go ask them. Now, you don't write words like that unless eyewitnesses actually exist to back it up. One indication of how seriously they took the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection is the detailed description they gave of these events. You see, if you're lying, you often skip over. You leave out some incidental details. I'm talking about just those little things that would allow someone who's trying to corroborate your story to know that what you say you saw or heard or did actually happened. So in the Gospel of Mark, for example... We're told that when Jesus buckled under the weight of carrying the cross, look at this, a certain man of Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now, look at that description of Simon again. The father of Alexander and Rufus. Doesn't it seem odd that this guy's kids' names would be inserted at such an intense, critical time in the storyline? You know, when I read that, it kind of reminds me of that new Geico commercial where the mom calls her son, who's apparently a spy, and he's on the run from the bad guys, and for some dumb reason, he answers his phone, and mom says, well, the squirrels are back in the attic. Your dad won't call the exterminator, and the tagline of the ad is this, if you're a mom, you call at the worst time. It's what you do. And so why would, bother, why would Mark bother to give the names of the children of the guy who helped Jesus carry his cross. It seems like not the best of times to insert this, oh, by the way, the squirrels are back in the attic, kind of incidental information. Well, it was because they were alive and they were known to the audience to whom Mark was writing. He's saying, listen, if you've got questions about his resurrection and, and his death, go ask Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. You see, this is not the kind of thing you do if you're writing a myth or if you're trying to describe a symbol. This is not metaphorical poetry. This is historical reality. On the day of his resurrection, Jesus appeared to two of his followers on the road to the little village of Emmaus, which is located on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. And they were so struck by their encounter with the risen Christ that they turned around and they ran seven miles back into the city of Jerusalem. And they said to the disciples, it's true, the Lord is risen indeed. That's our phrase right there. That's where the word indeed in the church's Easter greeting comes from. It's the early church's way of saying indeed it is true. Indeed, this did happen. This is not a metaphor. This is not just an inspirational, emotional boost. This is not a fairy tale given to comfort a child who's lost a pet or a sick person who's lost their health. There's only one explanation that accounts for the overnight transformation of an impoverished, confused, frightened little group of people into a courageous, emboldened community that would sacrifice everything, including their lives, to turn the world upside down, and that is they were eyewitnesses to this Jesus, their master, their teacher, their friend, who they saw die on a cross, whose body they put in a tomb, and then he was seen by them alive. The Lord is risen I want to talk to you about what that means for you and me, because I believe there is a promise that Easter gives to us. For one thing, the resurrection means that your worth does not fluctuate. Your worth does not fluctuate. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people over the past few years since the latest recession, 
And they've said things like this to me, Pastor, I'm worth 40% of what I was a few years ago. Or they said, my net worth has dropped in half. And I want to say to them, no, it is not. A few years ago, you were worth the life of God's son, Jesus Christ. That's still what you're worth today. And that will still be what you're worth tomorrow. Imagine a few days after the first Easter and the disciples, Peter and Andrew, who are brothers, and they're talking to each other. And Peter says to Andrew, he is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. But our fishing business has dropped off 40%. I feel like such a failure. I'm not sleeping well. I'm anxious. I don't know when things are going to turn around. You know, Andrew, it may be years before the fish start biting like they used to bite. I think Andrew would have said, are you crazy, Peter? He's risen indeed. And you're standing here telling me you can't sleep because of how many fish you're catching. I got to tell you the truth, brother. If he's risen indeed, who cares how the fish are biting? They're just fish. We're going to fish for people. Christ is risen. risen And that means money does not get to define your identity. That means your self-worth is in no way tied to your net worth. Your job, your vocation, your title, your position, whether the market is up or down, does not get to say what your value is. The apostle Peter wrote these great words when he said, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. Now, some of you, you've been beating yourselves up for a while because of what happened in your job or to your bank account or to the equity in your house over the last few years. And I pray that you can walk out of here today with your head held a little higher because to the God who created everything, to the God of this universe, you are worth more than every dollar, drachma, peso, pound, rupee, rubu, euro, or yen ever printed. You are worth the life of God's son. He died on the cross and he's risen. He's risen indeed. Here's another promise that Easter makes. Your future is not at risk. Your future is not at risk. No matter what happens, your future is not up for grabs. In September 2013, the headline on the cover of Time magazine read, look at that, can Google solve death? I didn't know they were trying. (laughs) Google's CEO announced a new division known as Calico, which is dedicated to health and aging issues and to solving the problem of death. The editors of Time magazine were so bold as to ask, Why Google, a high-tech company, is spending so many millions of dollars to deal with death's most, or with life's most absolute certainty, which is death. And I think that's a fair question. Why would Google spend so many millions on the problem of dying? Because all of us recognize that if we can deal with the pain and uncertainty and the grief of the most ultimate, final, and perhaps painful thing waiting for us in the future, our inevitable and unavoidable date with death, it can and should change how we live in the present. I heard about some college students who attended a Southern California Christian university and they would go door to door sometimes. And if people would engage with them, they would talk about their faith. And so one time they went to a door, they rang a doorbell and a frazzled looking young mom answered the door. She was trying to keep up with three preschoolers. This was obviously not a good time for her. She had a vacuum cleaner in one hand, a baby in the other, child crying in another room, something burning on the stove, another kid running down the hallway with a crayon marking on the walls. Television's blaring, that's the scene. Some of you moms know it. When she opened the door to them, these evangelistically eager students said to her, Madam, would you like to know how to have eternal life? She replied, frankly, I don't think I could stand it. You see, most people aren't interested in more of the same old thing. We're not interested in signing up to extend the current version of our reality throughout eternity. But the teaching of the resurrection of Jesus is not just that your soul is immortal and it will live on in some vague ethereal afterlife. The point of it is that God promised to set things right. The God that the world had a chance to come to know through the people of Israel and through the writings of Scripture, the God who has always promised that one day this sorry world that we all know is messed up and broken is going to be set right by him. And now with the resurrection of Jesus, it has started. He has overcome the ultimate enemy of humanity, death. He's going to redeem what he made. He said he would, and now it has begun. It's just that nobody thought it was going to start like this. Nobody saw a resurrection coming. I read about a woman who looked out her window one day and she saw her German shepherd dog, you know, a big dog, just shaking the life out of their neighbor's pet rabbit. 
Her family did not get along well with these particular neighbors. This was going to be a disaster for her to deal with. So she grabbed a broom. She beat the dog with it until the, he dropped the now extremely dead rabbit out of its mouth. She panicked. She didn't know what else to do. So she grabbed this lifeless rabbit. She took it inside. She gave it a bath. She blow dried it to its original fluffiness. She combed the hair on the rabbit, you know, and it was looking pretty good. And then she snuck back into the neighbor's yard and she propped the rabbit up in its cage. An hour later, she heard screams coming from next door and she asked her neighbor, what's going on? The neighbor said, our rabbit, our rabbit. He died two weeks ago. We buried him and now he's back. I guess you could say the neighbor didn't see that one coming, right? (laughs) And nobody saw the resurrection coming. Nobody was looking for I was dead, but now I'm not story. But then when it happened, they said, now we can see and it all makes sense and nothing can stop it. Now not even death can derail God's redemption story. And that story is that through Jesus, the good news is that up there is coming down here. And with his resurrection, a new creation has begun, and we get to be a part of it. And it's with absolute certainty. And what makes it certain is he is risen. risen Easter promises your worth is established. Easter promises your future is not at risk. And thirdly, Easter promises your past is not unforgivable. Isn't that good to know? Your past is not unforgivable. Brene Brown is a social researcher who has spent six years studying the leading causes of emotional distress so they could be measured, controlled, and predicted. But at the end of that research, she had an emotional breakdown herself. She told her compelling story in a TED talk, and a TED talk is a forum for spreading ideas through the leaders of technology, entertainment, and design, hence the acronym TED, usually through a series of short but powerful talks. Brene Brown said the the major cause of emotional distress, according to her research, was shame. And shame comes from some obvious things like feeling that you're not pretty or smart or slim enough. You don't meet others' expectations. You got laid off. You have to lay people off. Your marriage is failing. Your kids are failing. You're being abused or you're an abuser. You're not a meeting your own expectations. You've got to ask somebody for help. As she began to research it, she concluded that shame is rooted in the fear of being disconnected. It's a fear that says, if you knew what was really going on in my life, you would disconnect from me, and I cannot bear the thought of that, so I have to deal with this all by myself. It is the fear of discovery, she says, that drives shame. And then she revealed with great vulnerability that even though she knew all of this as a trained, experienced, and successful analyzer of sociological data, she herself had an emotional breakdown, and she spent a year in therapy. Her talk on the power of vulnerability is one of the top 10 most watched TED Talks of all time with 4.5 million viewers so far. Why did so many people watch that? Why did so many people tell their friends, you have to see this? More importantly, why was she being so vulnerable? It was because she discovered in her research, listen, that the great antidote to shame is empathy. It's someone else who with arms open wide and with genuine humility will say, me too, to whatever you're going through, to whatever you're struggling with. And Brene Brown pushes us to acknowledge our own brokenness and to embrace the reality that we're not alone in it. And that we are or easily could be just one step away from the broken people all around us. Brene Brown says most of us are one paycheck. We're one divorce. We're one drug addicted kid. We're one mental health diagnosis. We're one serious illness. We're one sexual assault. We're one drinking binge. We're one night of unprotected sex. We're one affair away from being one of those people. The ones that we don't trust. The ones that we pity the ones that we don't let our children play with, the ones that bad things happen to, the ones that we don't want living next door. Pastor Andy Stanley says it like this. He says, friends, you either are a mess, you were a mess, or you're just one dumb decision away from becoming a mess. I think, 
I think the beauty and the mystery of the gospel of Jesus that has allowed it to captivate so many people through the centuries and that will once again fill church buildings up like this one all around the world today is the incredible vulnerability of Jesus. The Son of God became human and took a flesh and blood body on himself, and he said, me too. I'm not removed from your suffering. In fact, I'm personally involved in it to the point that he would willingly and humbly carry our weaknesses and bear our sorrows and be pierced for our transgressions and be crushed for our iniquities. And he stretched his arms open wide on the cross. And yet somehow his punishment brings us peace and by his wounds and his stripes we are healed. Jesus' death and resurrection brings empathy like no other. But greater than his empathy with our struggles is his victory over sin and shame. That's what's behind the Apostle Paul's words when he wrote in Romans 7 with great vulnerability about his own struggle. Look at what he wrote. I do not understand what I do. You ever felt like that? For what I do not want to do, I do. But what I hate, I do. What a wretched man I am. Friends, that's the voice of shame. That's the voice of guilt. And most of us recognize that voice. That's the voice that says we'll always live with regret and defeat. We'll never change. But then just a few verses later, he writes, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The relentless power of sin calls for more than someone who can relate to us. It calls for someone who can rescue us. The voice of shame requires more than empathy and emotional support to be stilled. It requires victory and spiritual deliverance. Jesus, the God-man, brings both to us. Human empathy acknowledges hurting. Jesus' victory assures healing. Human empathy disarms shame. Jesus' victory defeats shame. Human empathy says you're not alone. Jesus' victory says you'll never be forsaken. Human empathy says me too. Jesus says it is finished. That means that nothing you've ever done is beyond God's ability to cleanse and forgive because Jesus carried your sins on the cross and he died and he is risen. He is risen indeed. Resurrection means your true worth is now established. Your future is not at risk. Your past is not unforgivable. And lastly, it means that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Wherever, wherever you have traveled, however old you may be, if you're a resurrection person, you've not seen the best. The best is yet to come. There's an old story. Maybe you've heard it before. It's about a woman, and she got a very serious health diagnosis. Her doctor told her that she had cancer, and she had only three months left to live. And he said, you should make your final preparation. So after she told her family, she contacted the pastor from her church, and she said, Pastor, I want to go over how I want things to go in my funeral service. And she said, I want these songs sung, and I want these scriptures read, and I want these people to speak. And I want to be buried with my favorite Bible. But she said, before you go, there's one more thing. He said, what's that? She said, now, this is very important to me, but it's going to sound strange to you. She said, I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. And the pastor looked puzzled. No one had ever made such a request before. And she explained, she said, you know, in all my years of going to church functions, whenever food was involved, my favorite part was when whoever was clearing the dishes of the main course would lean over and say, keep your fork, hold on to your fork. She said, that was my favorite part because I knew it meant something delicious and wonderful was coming and it wasn't going to be jello salad. <laughs> wasn't going to be a pineapple ring with cottage cheese in it. She says it was going to be something delightful and delicious with an enormous amount of calories, like chocolate layer cake or homemade deep dish apple pie. She, she said, I just want people to see me laying there in, in my casket with a fork in my hand, and I want them to say, what's the deal with the fork? <laughs> and she said, I want you to tell them something better is coming. Hold on to your fork. So I want to say to you this today. Maybe it's today when you leave this service, you're going to go consume a massive Easter brunch. <laughs> Can I ask you to let the humble fork be an icon of resurrection hope? That when you wrap your fingers around the fork, that will you let it remind you that something better is coming. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Friends, that's the ultimate promise of Easter. That's what resurrection means. But right after Jesus said those important words, he asked this vital question. He said, do you believe this? And this is where you and I come into the story. This is our part. You see, God has done his part. This is our part in experiencing the promise of Easter. And maybe you've drifted a long way from God, and today is the first time you've been in church in quite a while. I want to assure you, friend, you have not drifted farther away than God can reach through the cross of Jesus. He has reached people a lot farther away than you, and maybe you come from a totally different religious background. I want to tell you something. This is not, believing in Jesus is not about choosing a new religion. This is not about changing religions. In fact, I would argue following Jesus isn't about religion at all. One writer calls Christianity the unreligion because it turns our religious instincts on their heads. For example, the ancient Greeks told us to be moderate by knowing our inclinations. The Romans told us to be strong by ordering our lives. Buddhism tells us to be disillusioned by annihilating our consciousness. Hinduism tells us to be absorbed by emerging our souls. Islam tells us to be submissive by subjecting our wills. Agnosticism tells us to be at peace by ignoring our doubts. Moralism tells us to be good by discharging our obligations. Only the gospel tells us that we get free by acknowledging our failure and trusting in a savior who died for our sins when we were powerless to help ourselves and who rose from the grave as a forerunner of what he's going to do in the future. Christianity is the unreligion because religion spells salvation, D-O, do. Jesus spells salvation, D-O-N-E, done. This is not about religion. This is about a relationship with Jesus. And you can say yes to everything he's done for you in his death and burial and resurrection. It's just as simple as saying, God, I commit my life to you today. I want to receive your free gift of grace by trusting that Jesus is alive and he's here for me and he will forgive my sin and he'll lead my life. And when that happens, it's not just Easter on the calendar, then it's Easter in your life. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? I want to ask you if you would. And I I want us to take just a moment and allow this time to be just between you and God. And I know for many of you, Jesus Christ is risen in your life, not just historically, but personally for you. And uh, this is a great day of celebration. And you just want to say, thank you, God. Thank you for resurrection hope that's changed my life. But some of you have never personally responded to God before. And I want to tell you, there's a bloodstained cross. There's an empty tomb. There's a rolled away stone. And they all promise that your worth has been established. And your future is not at risk. And your past is not unforgivable. And the best is yet to come because he is risen. Say it one more time. He is risen indeed. If you believe that, then this is when you say yes. Maybe there's something you need to understand a little more. and You need to grow. We all need to grow. But we'd love as a church to help you with that. Maybe you have a friend that brought you here today. They invited you. I guarantee you could ask that friend, point me in the direction that I need to go so I can grow in this faith in Jesus. We're going to have some prayer partners down front here in just a moment. We're going to stand and we're going to sing in any way we can. We'd love to help you. But friend, let me tell you this. We cannot believe for you. You have to be willing to say, God, I don't understand much, but I understand this much. I have messed up and I get afraid and I need a friend and I need a forgiver like Jesus. And I'm saying yes to him right now. So, Father, I just want to thank you that in this fallen world, in this uncertain season, in this troubled time, Jesus Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. He wasn't in a tomb. He was everywhere else. And not just there and then, but he's here and he's now. And I say thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead, not metaphorically, but historically. It was good news for the first witnesses of the resurrection. It's good news for us today, and we're so grateful. Thank you for the hope that is ours in and through you. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen.